Welcome to the Reformed Informants, a podcast devoted to biblical exposition, systematic theology, and practical application for the good of the church. I'm Lance Burroughs, along with TJ Darty, and we are the Reformed Informants. Well, we're back for episode two. Finally, yeah. I know everybody's on the edge of their seat yeah. waiting for this bad boy to download. Finally, so, finally yeah, we came are glad out. That, yeah, uh, to be back, and we're, we're thankful that you're listening in. Um, yeah, if you didn't listen to episode one, you need to make sure you go back and do that. That was where we talked about what theology is, right? Like, how do we define it? How do we understand it? Lance, what was theology takeaway? What yeah, did we say theology was? Yeah, well, theology, the basic definition, we're talking about knowing God. Right, right. right. Yeah, and then um, the takeaway was, well, are, are you going to be good or bad at knowing right. God? Or right. Are you going to be a good or bad theologian? Right. And so, I mean, that's basically where we left off. Yeah, that was episode one. So if you didn't listen to it, there you go. You just got it wrapped up in five seconds. So yeah, and I, you're, and I you're would, up to speed. Yeah, yeah. But still go download it. Definitely. Um, but we, we did leave off, and we didn't leave a plug for this, but I, I guess we need to. That we we talked about some resources mm-hmm. uh, that you can navigate through and buy and whatever. Yeah, um, we're gonna have those posted on yeah. social media. So if and as you soon wanna, as we figure out how to plug it into the podcast, we'll do that too, so that you can yes. there'll be like a link or or whatever to our our Facebook page, our our Instagram, our Twitter, and then you'll have access to all those uh, resources there. Yeah, just a- absolutely, just things that we've we found useful, helpful. Um, you know, theology for the church. Just, just trying to make it accessible for us. Yep. So, so oh, ep two. Yeah. Here we go. What episode two. What, what do we got today? How to do theology. Okay. Okay. So, we're just looking for practicality here. Okay. How can we actually do this thing? Like, if we're wanting to sit down today, and right? If you haven't done systematic theology before, right? And you are looking to get into that, to dive into that, you know, at least get your feet wet. Yeah where would you start? Like, how would you go about doing this? So okay, you just fling open the scripture and... Right, you're with, trying to write a 1,500-page, uh, you know, mega book on, on all the doctrine of, of, of the Bible. Is that what you're talking about? Or yeah, you, right. maybe, maybe a more simplified yeah. version. Yeah, so um, for us to begin, let's begin by asking where we would begin or right. where, where, where should somebody begin when they're first exposed to what systematic theology is and, and now they're now they're, they're they're seated at a desk in a chair at a table mm-hmm. and they're ready to go where, yeah. where would we begin where would you begin you, tj you, you gotta have the bible that's 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 the starting place um for any theological discussion Why? because that is how god has revealed himself okay. so I can have a dream tonight that God says something to me, but the reality is that God has already said something. He has already revealed something, and that something is the Word of God that has been recorded for us in the Old and New Testament and put together. Those 66 books are God's revelation to us. And so that is our starting point. So if we're going to develop any kind of theology, if we're going to uh, try to understand, to know God, um, we have to look at what God has said. So we're going to open the Word of God. So that's that's yeah. the place I'm going to start. And you have to trust it. Right. And you have to be confident in it. Right. Just because it's 2,000 years plus, plus years old, mm-hmm. uh, that that shouldn't be a roadblock or a stumbling block or a, you know. In fact, it should be the opposite, right? Yeah, like that it has been preserved a, a, over absolutely. that course of, uh, over that course of time. Yeah, that that doesn't need to trip you up, right? You, you right. have to start with the scripture. Be confident that the scripture is the word of God, right? Uh, e- even if you're new to it, and you've got to have absolute confidence that it is the authority, and it's the authority for what you're about to endeavor. Right. Okay. So I'm going to begin with scripture. Um, but what do I do now that I've begun? I've now got my Bible open. Um, <laughs> how do, what does that process look like? How do I, uh, start to develop or, um, uh, do theology? How do, how, where do, where well, do I go It seems daunting at first, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it, 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 it is daunting. It, it is overwhelming to think about. Um, so, so simplify that. How do I, how do I actually, um, like, here's my question. Do I, okay. do I try to read the entire Bible all the way through, um, in one sitting one day, right? you know, like, or am I taking off sizable chunks? Am I looking like, what would you say? 
How how would you how would you encourage me to get started in this? Well, I think at least as a as a general practice, you just you have to be reading scripture. That's right. So, in, in one sense, should you open up to Genesis and begin at chapter one, verse one? I, I think absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You should do that because we're talking about the totality of scripture. You need to yeah know, understand, and eventually master. That's to right. some degree, all of Scripture. That's right. So I think that's just a general reference or starting point, whether it's systematic or any other type of that's theology. Right. You, yeah. you just have you have to, you have to read the Word. And the more you read the Word, the more familiar you become, the more comfortable uh, speaking the language of the Word you become. That is a necessary component to doing theology: is a knowledge of the Word. Um, so is is it limited to just okay? So. I'm going to tell my buddy down the street, hey, look, just start reading Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and then your systematic theology is going to develop out of that. Is, is that the ad- advice that I would give him, or h- how would you expand on that or at least add to that? Yeah, well, certainly you have to begin there, but you can't just end there um, because we. you mentioned this um, in our first episode, we are fallen creatures. We have limitations um, we, we do not have a perfect understanding every time we open the word of God. In fact, most of the time when I find myself in depth studying God's word, I'm on my face in prayer because I struggle to understand. And it's only by the spirit, uh, working to open my eyes so that I might understand that I have an ability to, to make sense of the word. Uh, but one of the tremendous advantages we have as we are 2,000 years into Christian history. And so I'm going to pay attention and see what have other Christian theologians, respected men of the church, how have they right. done theology, okay. right? Yes. So, yeah, so we we touched on that a bit last episode. That's right. You're starting with Scripture, looking through Scripture, reading, studying, memorizing, meditating, like you said, mm-hmm. praying mm-hmm. about the text that you're reading. Then move into church history. Mm-hmm. What have Christians throughout the century said, and what about con- like contemporary church leaders? Like, I mean, would you like would you quote? Uh, a, is it okay to quote a John Piper or right. well, a I mean, Steve Lawson? Right. Or is it okay uh, to quote those guys in the midst of their ministry? Yeah, I mean, we we last episode we referenced J.I. Packer, okay. right? Like. There's it's tremendous like value in that. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. I think I think he's seriously like 92 or 93. Yeah, but he's still alive, so he's still he's still serving. Uh, but there is value in that guy. There is value in Piper or Lawson or who, whatever uh, Paul Washer. These men of the faith. Um, but I would caution us against wholesale adopting anything and everything that one individual says. Um, we are, especially in our age today, we are overexposed, right? We have so much at our fingertips. And if we are not discerning, um, we can tend to just replicate and regurgitate what we hear, what we see. We, we can go just come, kind of become programmed in that way. So we pay attention to what they say. Um, but, but men of the faith whose work and uh, ministry and theology that has persisted over time is even more valuable. Right. 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 Yeah. So to expand on that a little bit, looking back into church history, we do have to be careful with looking back at just one particular individual. Yes. Right. Yes. Because before we know it, it's almost as if we become that individual. Right. And we're now preaching what they were preaching and not maybe necessarily. Right. Right preaching the scripture and, and even all, if their interpretations are right that's right so you're saying we should have a variety yes all, and all of our all of our christian heroes of the faith i mean you and i have both studied um great men of the faith that that we that we depend on i mean we we use their their minds and their work that they have given to the church um for our benefit but those guys have blind spots all of them do right and if you're if you only look at one guy you only look at two guys you are uh, you're going to imbibe their their blind spots as well and so we have to be willing to come to the text to say hey i do have blind spots um help me as i start to navigate this help me to 
to be able to be aware of them, but also to be able to try to work around them. Right. Right. So no, that's good. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a helpful process for us. Okay. So I've got the text in front of me. Yeah. I'm reading the text. I'm working through Genesis. I'm getting through all of those historical accounts of the, mm-hmm. you know, of the early world. Yeah. The patriarchs. The, and, yeah. Right. Patriarchs on throughout. Now I'm making my way into the Exodus and Moses, mm-hmm. or, you know, getting to know, um, how God is faithful, even in the midst of a rebellious people, all of those things. Yes. Yes. Okay. But then all of a sudden I come across the Psalms. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Or I'm working through the Proverbs like, okay, clearly something's up because when I read the Psalms or read the Proverbs, um, it's not they reading don't read just the like same. Genesis and Exodus. So, right. um, I don't know. I mean, what are some of the, some of the issues that I have to have to work through and navigate through? And um, are, I mean, are those books avoidable? Like, should I not? You know. Anyways. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm so let you take it away here on no, that. No, no. So when you're saying that, I, I think first of all, we have to be willing to embrace and deal with the whole counsel of God, right? Like, we can't pick and choose um, the easy passages or the more pleasing passages for us to study and read. Um, okay, hold on, let me stop you there. Yeah. Systematic theology doesn't avoid passages. Okay. Like you're saying. Yeah, it can't. That, that's not systematic theology. Right. That is me picking and choosing stuff because right. something may be difficult because I may understand it or whatever. But once you start doing that, you're not doing systematic theology. Okay, why not? Well, because... <laughs> Because you're not getting the whole counsel of God right. on, on the issue right. like you were going. Okay. Right. So yeah. So okay. You're exactly you're right. You were going to say that anyways, but I just wanted to. No, that's fine. Don't I ever don't ever it. cut me off again. <laughs> um, so so you 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 have to be willing to embrace all of the different um, biblical passages that deal with an individual doctrine, um, and you have to be willing to deal with those doctrines and those passages on their own terms. So uh, a, a helpful term. Uh, that I think is worth defining or exposing us to is this concept of hermeneutics. Okay. Uh, w- what What is hermeneutics and how does hermeneutics apply? I'm going to kick this over to you. How does hermeneutics affect the way that we interpret passages of Scripture? Well, bad hermeneutics, bad uh, interpretations of okay. the text of Scripture. Okay. So, I mean, just generally, literally, grammatical, um, or the literal grammatical historical approach to the text. If you can just take those basic approaches in studying the text, um, reading the text, generally speaking, literally, because a majority of scripture is literal. Mm-hmm. Now there are places we'll talk about those things later on. Uh, then you want to take a grammatical approach. What, 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 what is the structure of the sentence? What, what do you find in if you have the advantage to look back at Hebrew and Greek, mm-hmm. and then you you want to look at the context, yeah, the historical aspect of, you know, what's going on around the time of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. Why is that such an important issue? Or that's right. I mean, you, again, you can pick any passage because every passage has a context or historical. Yeah. Situation yeah, I, I think the most helpful hermeneutics, and when we talk about hermeneutics, that's just interpretation right right like that's the right. the, the art and practice of interpreting. word yeah it's 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 awesome but when i think of hermeneutics the most helpful um the most helpful concept that i was exposed to is the idea of authorial intent yeah and what that means is that the author meant something when the author wrote it so if i write a letter to my wife that has very specific and Um, intimate details that only she would understand when she picks that letter up, she's going to understand what I meant. You might pick that letter up and think that I meant something completely different, but what you think does not change what I meant. And so the author's intended meaning is the meaning of the text, right? Like we, this is why I had, this is why I wanted TJ to host with me here because what I just said was not as beautiful. Well, that's, he explained it's that. all relative. <laughs> it's all relative. Because what I'm thinking is, is that if we, we live in a postmodern world, right? That, that, it, that things mean what we want them to mean. Like your truth is your truth. And my truth is my truth. But that's, 
that's just, first of all, that's folly. It doesn't that doesn't hold up. Um, there has to be a higher standard of truth, and we would all agree that to that, whether or not we say it out loud. Um, but but the author's intended purpose um, stands regardless of whether or not. I understand it. Right. Right. Like he, the author, both the human and the spirit have an intended meaning to the text. And that is our task in hermeneutics. Well, we want to understand. Yeah. Lord willing in the future, if I was to write a book and I'm selling it on Amazon Mm -hmm. and I scroll down and read the reviews and we'll link it in the, in the bio. Yeah. Of course. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, Free, free pub. So if I start looking through the reviews And as I'm navigating through the reviews and someone's giving an overall review of the book, basically on what the book was about Mm -hmm. and they miss the entire thing. Right. I'm going to be a little bummed that they didn't get my intent. Which is, which is if they don't get your intent, then they don't truly understand, which means they can't really interact with what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, So how, how, how much more exactly with, God's word, should we understand the intent of the author? Again, if we if we don't have the right interpretation, intent of the author, then, yeah. we, then we don't actually have the scripture. That's right. And and that's going to depend. You mentioned context. You mentioned um, the, the historical setting, the genre, right? The type of literature. Yeah. Um, historical narrative is going to be seeking to tell a story um, uh, with an intended purpose behind that story, whereas um, the Psalms and some of the wisdom literature is in is more designed to teach principles, um, which is not going to be necessarily the same type of literal uh, historical development, but sure. rather teaching principles and concepts. You get, you have the same thing with Paul. He's writing to specific churches in specific contexts. Right. Uh, you can't pull a passage out of the book of Ephesians and, and apply it to Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Right. Like that, that there is application there, but it's not direct because he's writing to a specific context. So you have to understand yeah. what does he mean and why is he saying it? And then when you've done that, then you can pull that out to be able to develop that theology. Right. Yeah. I think yeah, to add to that before we move on to the next point, I, I think the best example in the new Testament um, of what you're speaking of authorial intent is revelation two and three when john's mm. writing to the seven churches he liter- he has specific things that he's addressing in those particular churches but even within the meaning that john is trying to convey to those churches of right. whether he's wanting him to correct something whether he's commending them or whatnot there's still eternal truths that come out of, of course, the authorial intent to that specific church or that specific location. No, I think that's really good. Um, okay, so let's say that we do understand authorial intent. Let's say we've spent the time, we've, we've uh, been interpreting passages of Scripture, we've exposed ourselves to the biblical narrative. And it takes time, by the way. It does, like, this exactly. This is not an overnight deal. Exactly. Um, that's, a, that's a great point. We're constantly, and we're, you're never finished, that's another point. It takes time, but you're never going to be finished. You're always going to be doing theology. You're always going to be refining and working um, to be able to develop this system and to be able to understand the biblical content. But as I'm exposing myself to Scripture, I'm interpreting, uh, I'm paying attention to what church history has taught me. Now, how do I organize it, right? Like now you've got all of your, to use your analogy from our previous discussion, you've got all the pieces uh, laid out. Uh, you're about to build the table. How do I how do I organize it? Yeah, but, I have everything. I don't want to go back to Home Depot and Lowe's. That's right. You've got it all here. But how do I how do you put it in a a an organized way so that you know where it is and so you understand how they fit together? Yeah, I think you have to grab and pull uh, your main doctrines, your core tenets, what mm-hmm. basically makes up Christianity. Okay. Um. And, and so, I mean, we put together a list. You can find these lists in yeah. any systematic yeah. theology because generally everybody's accepted. Well, these are the main points that right. are addressed in systematic and, theology. And some of I them mean, how much will... leeway are there in the main points that you found, at least in your research? Yeah, All that... of them basically cover... That's that's right. There are uh, these these uh, different c- 
categories or, or biblical doctrines are all covered in some sense because they are exhaustive of the scriptures. Uh, they might be expressed differently. Uh, they might be organized differently. But in reality, your main biblical doctrines are going to be covered, and they have to be covered in order to adequately deal with the biblical right. text, right? So so when I think of what are the main categories, well, you've got to have an understanding of what the Bible is. you got to understand of who God is in the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, the Spirit. Right. Um, you've got to understand who man is. You've got to understand salvation. Um, you've got to understand uh, the church, and then you've got to understand end times. Right. Uh, you know, you've got discussion of angels, which which uh, plays in. You've got a discussion of sin, which is related to to man. But those are the broad categories, right? So, so give me an example. If I'm trying to think through these things, if I read through a passage, um, and I'm trying to to develop. Uh, my understanding of systematic theology. Give me an example of how this might actually play out. Um, how, how does how does this what does this actually look like? Yeah. So let's take Christology. Okay. All right. So let's pull Christology out of the bag of categories of systematic theology, and let's just spend the rest of the time. Yeah. Uh, looking at Christology in particular. Okay. I think um, yeah, I think that'll be helpful. So, I mean, if we're taking the whole of Scripture. And we're looking at Christ only. I, I think there's many ways that you could start or approach to getting into that. I, I think I would prefer going in the order of Scripture as it's been revealed uh, by God. I, I would start back in the Old Testament, even even with Christ. Uh, I, yeah. Okay. I, I think. I mean, again, I think there's a couple ways you could approach it. Um, I, I I would like to go back to the Old Testament Scripture. Um, in particular, looking at passages where we've got theophanies, mm-hmm. maybe appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. Um, I will look at scriptures that deal with um, prophecies concerning the coming Messiah. Okay, uh, That's really I think good. That, that would be a good route to go. Um, I, I think you could even, and you're going to need help from the New Testament on this one, but you can even go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. That's right. God creating, well, now you've got... That's right. Colossians one, That's Hebrews right. one, John one. So um, great. Now I know everybody's passages. just massively confused because I, I can't give a, a, no, no, a, a no. starting I'll, point. I'll clean it up. Go ahead. But yeah, TJ, clean. Please, <laughs> please clean this up for me. No, keep no, keep going. I think I think you're you're, you're all over it. Keep going. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, that, that's the route I would go. Um, I, I think generally teaching that the last few years, um, we look at Christ in the Old Testament um, first. And then we use the new to develop that, okay. to unfold mm-hmm. that. And in a similar way, which uh, Jesus used on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. That's right. When, when he's teaching and talking to the 11 uh, post-resurrection. That's right. Uh, another appearance. Um, he's going back to the law, the Psalms, yeah. and the prophets, and he's expounding to them the scriptures concerning himself. That's right. Um I just I just taught this past week on Acts 17, and this is exactly what Paul does. He goes to he goes to the synagogue and he reasons with the Jews from the scriptures. Well, of yeah, course, okay. that's the Old Testament. Okay, so reason. Yeah. What, what do you mean that he he reasons with them? Well, he, he's he, lackluster. He's not dogmatic. No. Um. But what do you mean by by reasoning? Yeah, when he's reasoning with them, he's okay. he is arguing. He is expounding. He is uh demonstrating to them who Christ is from the Old Testament. Um, Acts 17, Luke tells us that he is he's opening their eyes and setting before them the realities and the truth that the Christ had to suffer and had to die and had to be resurrected. And so you're exactly right. That's, that's where you have to go. Um, and of course, we have an understanding of the New Testament first, right? Like you're not sitting down to do systematic yeah. theology and starting with Genesis 1 with no understanding of right. the New Testament, we've been exposed to the gospel, so we know who Christ is. Um, but in developing that theology, I think it's helpful, like you said, to do it as as God has revealed um, through the Old Testament, looking at the prophecies, uh, coming of who he is. So when we think about Christology, typically um, there are two main categories that we develop when we think about um, Christ— we think of the person of Christ and we think of the work of Christ, right? Like that's 
That's a, a traditional systematic approach, who Christ is and then what Christ accomplished. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we will talk more extensively about both of these matters. But if I'm doing theology, how do I do this? Because here, here's my here's here's an example. I'm trying to figure out who Christ is. And I read in the New Testament that Jesus grew in wisdom, that he right. learned obedience, that he got hungry and he ate and he got tired and he slept, right? So when I read that, I don't think Jesus is God. Right. I think Jesus is man. Okay. Okay. So how do I reconcile that then with another passage where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Right. You know, like I, what, what do I do with those things? Yeah. Well, you can't, you can't stop. Um, with just those passages that speak of his humanity. Okay. In other words, you, you have to continue to dive into that more than just those couple references that you talked about from Luke, talking about wisdom and stature, Jesus is growing, mm-hmm. it, you know, uh, th- those particular texts. So you're saying I have to collect all the biblical material related uh, yeah, to Christ. Absolutely. Well, if you just want to zone in, and I know this is kind of your field, you know, looking back in church history and mm-hmm. looking at heirs and councils responding to, you mm-hmm. know, heretical teachings. But if you just look up passages that deal with the humanity of Christ, which there are numerous amounts of, of passages that do that. Because he was fully human. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But if, if you stop there and your conclusion is at the end of your systematic theology time that Christ was only a man and he was only a teacher, well, well, now <laughs> you are moved into a, a line of thought and thinking that isn't consistent with the Scripture. That's right. But now yeah. historical theology is going to probably put you in your place, too, because it, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. Yeah. Well, okay, so I, you, you took that exactly where I wanted to go. The If you come to the conclusion that Jesus was only man and not God— you have not adequately dealt with all the biblical sure. material. That's right? part of the person exactly. of Christ. Exactly. That's part of the person of Christ. But you, if you're going to deal with the whole counsel of God, you have to deal with the passages that say, because like you said earlier, you can't pick and choose in systematic theology. You've got to deal with them all. So if, if you get to that point where you walk out and you say, Jesus is fully man, and that's where you stop, historical theology gives you that guardrail that says, hold on a second. Because you can go all the way back to the 4th century and you're dealing with prominent ecumenical councils of the church uh, in 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea gathers together. They denounce Arianism, which says that Jesus was a created, he was the first created being in all of creation, that he was the preeminent creation, uh, and, and that he is therefore not fully divine. Right. That he became divine. Um that he's not eternally divine. That's an error that does not understand Scripture, and church history has rejected that. Church history does the same thing uh, with other councils that say that he was not fully human because his his humanity was absorbed into his divine nature. Right, um, which uh, is nowhere in the Bible. Exactly. So this is assuming you inadequately deal with the biblical material. Church history is going to help. Historical theology helps push you back, right? Like go back and consider, do you really understand what the text is saying? Right. Right. So we've got to deal with that. Now, let's say that we're still a little bit unsure. What one other area, theologically speaking, might help us if if I've got a human Jesus, but not a divine Jesus, how is this going to show up in the rest of my theology? How's it going to affect the rest of my systematic theology? Well, uh, immediately what rings a bell with me is, okay, well, now you've got some issues with the Trinity. Okay, okay. that's right. Uh, you've got some major issues with that because there is no Trinity if Jesus Christ is not God. That's right. Um, but the, the, then even just practically looking at I'm a sinner in need of salvation, mm-hmm. uh, salvation cannot come through Jesus if he is a man only. That's right. That's right. um, so we're in trouble. Yeah. The okay. Not yeah. Not only are you getting the the person of Christ completely misconstrued, but now the gospel is no longer the gospel. Mm-hmm. There is no good news, and I cannot be saved from my sins. That's right. Um, yeah. The wrath of God cannot be satisfied by a being that is not eternal. Right. Like it. Like it has to be 
Christ the deity on the cross in order for that sacrifice to be effective right. for eternity. Right, like that, yeah. that that is that is only a small part, by the way, of how the deity of Christ is, impacts our uh, soteriology or our, our salvation. Um, but you're exactly like like this is why systematic theology is so helpful, is because the systems go together. So yeah, it, it, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you were mentioning angels. I, I think was that the last episode. You yeah, were I think it was yeah. yeah episode one. So it makes no sense for angels to be making birth announcements for right. John the Baptist and Jesus. John is the forerunner, obviously. Right, right. It, it makes no sense for angels to behave as messengers of God to announce this man that's only a man. Right, right. right. I, I, I've said it, and I'll, I'm sure I'm going to say it all the time, but it's a checks and balances. Like no, no, Now I think it misconstrues uh, one of the primary functions of angels to announce Christ to minister to Christ, strengthen Christ, and you know the temptation of course. to be there at the tomb for you know ascension, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, yeah. Okay, it, it, so surely, yeah, we, yeah. There's problems, right? So, so you're dealing with a threefold process by which you have, uh, if you, as you develop, as you develop your theological perspective on Christology, you're trying to develop the person of Christ. Um, you start with the biblical witness and you properly interpret the text. Should you err and struggle, you're going to be confronted by church history. As long as you are doing historical theology, church history will confront you and will say, go back, reconsider. But should you ignore that or maybe misunderstand that, you're now going to have significant deviations and implications throughout the rest of your theology. So you have major uh, cross uh, crossroads and major problems that come when you have a theological dimension that gets out, out, out of line. And then how can I live for the glory of God? How can I live for Christ and his glory and his honor and pursue knowing God if I, I have all of these errors and holes in yeah. my understanding of Scripture? A- yeah, amen. So the, the practicality side of it, well, not only is it dishonoring God, but... Uh, again, now I, I really can't function um, as far as sanctification right. or any of those right. things are concerned. Right. Okay. So, how do what do we take away? Informants initiative. Time? It's it's time? time. The informants initiative. I'll let you go first this time. Okay. Uh, for two reasons. One, you you'll probably complain if I say something first. You'll want to steal it from me. And two is yeah. I haven't really thought about it yet, so I'm going to let you <laughs> go as I as I try to. Think about how I might want to express this. So, informant's initiative. Yeah, he's going to clean up my mess here. (laughs) Well, we'll see. Pressure's on. I've got for the initiative this go around that uh, doing theology teaches the body of Christ to turn to the scriptures on all matters, especially the foundational components of the Christian faith. In, In other words, doing theology, it binds us to the word of God. Amen. And every single matter, and especially the the core tenets of the faith. Like yeah. if we get Christ wrong, like we are now on dangerous turf. Yeah. This is this is bad news. I, yeah. Well said. Um, yeah. I mean that that's my immediate takeaway. Like it, it forces us. It forces me to get into the Word of God. And to continuously stay there. That's right. Not deviate. That's Can't good. deviate. Well, that was gonna be what I was gonna say, but of course you yeah, took okay. it. Now um, you're on. Now you're on the spot. Yeah, we, but if we, I we need something here. Okay. What what takeaway do I have? I would say this: that theology must be consistent, and 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 this ties into what you're saying about the scriptures. But that the, because the word of God is not contradictory, because the word of God is consistent in and of itself, my theological convictions have to be consistent. In other words, I cannot have a Trinitarian theology while also denying the deity of Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So my, right. my theology. So in other words, I, as I 
pay attention to how I'm doing theology and my theological convictions, I have to constantly ask myself, if I hold this to be a correct understanding of the Bible, what implications does that have on other areas of theology? What implications does that have on how I live? What what implications does that have on the way in which I view others and the way in which I view God? Because theology is always cohesive and connected to one another. Uh, that's, how's that? How's that for on so the spot, good, man? Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was about to say that, of course. but I guess we'll, we'll wrap yeah. up with well, that. That's uh, that, that's how that's how episode two ends. What do we got? Episode three. What's coming next? Um, let me see here. Well, first off, are you on dinner duty tonight? I am. Yeah. What are you making? Uh, I'm actually picking up Chipotle because so, uh, it looks like I'm a few minutes behind. Chipotle. So, uh, it's it's uh yeah the clock's ticking here. So yeah, I think uh, for episode three, it looks like we've got why does theology matter? Okay. Uh, I think that may be the next one. We'll see if that actually um, comes to fruition, but that's the that's yeah. the tentative plan. Or maybe the next one could be also what is the gospel? Okay. I think that's what we've got here. So all right. Well, we got Anyways. some some exciting stuff coming along. Yeah, so. absolutely. All right, well, until next time. Yeah, good work. If you're not doing so already, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and our YouTube channel. Also, be sure to like us on Facebook at Reformed Informants and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at R underscore Informants. If you have any questions or suggestions for topics of discussion, feel free to email us at reformedinformants at gmail.com. 